Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today. Welcome to our Disability Etiquette and Awareness Training Webinar for Nightlife Businesses. I'm Jose Sogard, uh, Deputy Director for the Office of Nightlife. For those of you who don't know, we are a liaison between the city and the nightlife industry of businesses, workers, performers, and patrons. If you have any issues or questions, you can always feel free to reach out to us at nightlife at media.nyc.gov, and that address is on the screen right now. Today's webinar is part of a new series of courses that we've created called Night School, or Nightlife Industry Training and Education. This is a series to share resources and trainings for businesses and workers and patrons with sessions on how best to engage with city agencies, learn tips for proactive harm reduction, addressing quality of life issues, and more. You can find out more information at nyc.gov slash night school. That's N-I-T-E school. And we will put a link in the chat. Today, we're very happy to share with you a presentation from the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, or MOPD. They are here today to present uh, some tips and strategies for how you can get started or go further toward creating a more inclusive environment for all New Yorkers. Empower you and your staff with best practices for interacting with people with disabilities. We're so excited to have them here today. Thank you for joining us. Before I introduce them to conduct the presentation, I just want to share a few quick housekeeping notes. First, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to let us know your questions throughout the meeting, as well as after the presentation, we'll have some additional time for Q&A. I also want to acknowledge that we are joined by ASL interpreters. You can use the interpretation function at the bottom of your toolbar. Alyssa and Andrea, thank you so much for being with us today as well. If you would also like to use the captions function, you can do that in your Zoom as well. And this meeting is also being recorded and live streamed to Facebook. A recording will be available to share with anyone you know who would like to view uh, this webinar at a later time. And again, you can also visit nyc.gov slash night school, N-I-T-E school, to find information on other scheduled trainings and webinars that are part of this series. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn over to my colleagues from MOPD. Uh, Eli Ramos and Arthur Jacobs will be uh, conducting the presentation today. Thank you both for being with us here today and for sharing this important uh, information with our nightlife community. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, to the Disability Etiquette and Awareness Training. Um, we are going to skip the access check because we just did that. Um, and move straight into the presentation. So we are the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. My name is Arthur Jacobs. I am a Caucasian male, white male in my mid 40s with blonde hair and blue eyes, and I am blind. Um, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities is a liaison agency between um, the different city agencies and the disability community. We try to work with the city agencies to make sure that they're programs and services are accessible to all New Yorkers, including those with disabilities. Um, these, this is our contact info on this slide, um, including our social media. Um, and you'll, the slide deck will be available, so um, you don't need to you know, furiously be writing down these notes. You'll, you'll get this info. So today's agenda, we're going to start off with an introduction to disability. We're going to move into laws and statistics, talk about language um, around disability, some of the basics of interacting with people with disabilities, then move into the, the real meat of the presentation and talk about different disability types and how to interact with those people, um, and then uh, talk a bit about resources. So intro to disability, we're going to start with the models of disability, a little bit about disability justice, and then level set with a disability glossary. So the first model of disability we'd like to discuss is referred to as the medical model of disability. This is uh, really focuses on what an individual is unable to do, and um, it, it aims to kind of normalize, quote unquote, the person with a disability. So to make them fit into what society sees as quote unquote normal. Um, so it, for instance, if I as a blind person 
was to meet somebody for the first time who, who viewed disability this way, they would probably ask me questions like, oh, have you tried laser, laser surgery? How about that bionic eye? I saw that on a TV show. That works, right? Um, so, you know, asking me things about ways that I can fix myself, right? Um, or to become quote unquote normal. Um, and again, the emphasis really is on what people cannot do as opposed to the social model of disability, which really focuses on what a person can do. So it views disability as a social construct. So people with disabilities encounter disabling conditions based on um, the barriers that they encounter in society. So if, let's say I was a wheelchair user, um, going to a job interview in a building and I get there and there's you know, a bunch of steps to get in and there isn't a ramp or any kind of accessible entrance, then I'm experiencing a disabling condition at that point. You know, before then I was able to get to the building, no problems, um, but it's that barrier that causes the issue. Um, if I go to that building and there isn't any kind of steps uh, or there's a ramp, there are steps, but there's a ramp, then I'm not encountering a disabling condition and I'm able to go for that job interview and have the same kind of um, a, a, a opportunities that everybody else would have. So um, we really try to think about disability in a way where, you know, when you remove those barriers, you empower people with disabilities uh, to reach their full potential. Um, and so as a blind guy, if somebody encountered me for the, you know, met me for the first time and saw disability this way, their questions would be more along the lines of, oh, how do you use a computer? How do you use a smartphone? How do you cross the street? Right? They'd, they'd start from that uh, perspective of, well, he can do these things and I just wonder how he gets them done. Then there's the disability justice movement, which uh, came out of the disability rights movement and really focuses on the fact that we as people with disabilities um, have a bunch of different aspects of, of who we are that is more than just our disability. So depending on our gender, on our ethnicity, on um, you know, our upbringing, the different experiences that we have, there is intersectionality there um, and that, that affects the way that we experience our disability. We're not just disabled. And here are some terms that we're gonna be using or that you'll hear around disability. Um, accessibility, when we say accessibility, we're ta really talking about not just that something is available, but that it's actually usable to everyone, including those with disability. Then there's ableism, which oftentimes comes out in the language that we use. Um, this is the view that me as a person without a disability um, or just that people without disabilities generally are better than or more capable than um, people with disabilities. So again, it comes out a lot in the language that we use um, and uh, you know the, the way that we think about people. And inspiration, oftentimes people with disabilities are seen as inspirational um, just for the kind of ordinary things that they do uh, in life. Um, you know, because uh, a person without a disability sees them as, oh, well, this, this, whatever it is they're doing, this blind guy's crossing the street. Oh, wow. You know, that's for me, that's an everyday thing. It's a normal thing. It's not anything special. Um, it's really not that inspirational. It just takes some techniques. And uh, so, you know, it, it, we'd prefer that you see us as inspirational for the, the really cool things that we're doing that, you know, anybody would be seen as inspirational. Hey, I just climbed Mount Everest, right? That, that's inspirational. I just, um, you know, ran a, a three minute mile, you know, which is, you know, incredible. <laughs> that's like Superman speeds. So, you know, um, those are the kinds of things we'd want to be seen as inspirational about. Then there's this idea of interdependence and independence, and these aren't mutually exclusive, right? To be independent, you're going to be interdependent. We all are. Everybody in society is. We have family and friends that we rely on, you know, our support systems, even society and government as a whole, right? We rely on the police department to keep us safe and the fire department to 
to keep us safe. And, you know, um, all these things that we rely on and we're interdependent on, um, even just our neighbors. So being independent is really about agency. It's about having the ability to be in charge of what happens to you, for you, about you, um, and, and making decisions around those things um, without other people doing it for you. And then interdependence, I'm not going to spend any time on that because we just talked about it in the previous slide. All right, we're going to move into laws and statistics. We're going to look at the definition, the legal definition of disability, and then talk about a little bit about uh, what disability looks like here in the city. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, was the, really the first law that defined disability. And it says that it's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. I'm going to stop there a sec. You might ask yourself, what's a major life activity? Well, think about all the things that you do every single day, you know, throughout the day. So walking, talking, running, breathing, eating, um, working, sleeping, you know, all of these things that we just do on a normal everyday basis. These are major life activities. Um, it also covers having a record of such an impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. Um, so those are the kind of the three ways you can be seen as having a disability. And then the New York City Human Rights Law also defines disability, and it, it basically uses the same definition. The major difference is it doesn't use substantially in it, uh, but that it just limits a major life activity. Um, and so the, the New York City Human Rights Law is actually more protective. It's one of the most protective human rights laws in the country, actually. Um, so that's good to keep in mind. All right, some statistics about disability here in the city. Now, just so as a note, these are based on self-reporting um, through the Census Bureau. Um, so these are people who are self-identifying as having a disability. Uh, you'll notice there are different categories here. If you added up all these numbers, it would end up being more than this 945,000 because oftentimes people identify as having more than one type of disability. Somebody might be both deaf and blind, for instance, um, or use a wheelchair and also have a hearing loss, right? So um, there are all kinds of different combinations. Um, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the last two categories just to help identify them a little more. A self-care disability is, something that um, impacts your ability to take care of yourself physically, right? So think about eating, toileting, bathing, these kinds of things. Um, whereas an independent living disability is something that affects your ability to live on your own. So think cooking, cleaning, doing your laundry, doing shopping, you know, running a household, that sort of thing. Um, and again, these are self-reported, so it, it ends up being about 11% of New York City's population. We actually think that's about half the actual number. We think it's closer to 20%, um, or even as high as 25%, depending on who you ask. So, all right, so I'm going to pass it over to Eli now to talk about language. Great. Thanks, Arthur. Uh, I'm trying to toggle the video, but it seems to be stuck. Uh, but in any case, uh, I am a Latino male in my early 30s. Um, I have uh, black hair, dark brown eyes, olive skin. I'm wearing a gray plaid shirt, and um, I have the um, same New York City skyline that you see on this slide as my background, uh, virtual background. Uh, anyways, so we're going to go over some language tips here. Uh, first, a, a little overview. Then we're going to go into the notions of people first versus identity first language. And also uh, just things to avoid in interactions moving forward. Um, one second here. Okay, great. There we go. Hello, everybody. All right. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, empowering language. So again, as I was saying, there's the notion of um, identity first versus people first. Um, and with identity first language, um, just as it says, it's leading with the disability. And again, 
it's not that one of these is more preferred than the other. It simply has to do with the way you were raised, your cultural background, perhaps the um, the sort of uh, upbringing that you had. Um, here in the States, we tend to prefer person first language. It's the same reason you might say person of color as opposed to colored person, which you know has become passe to say the very least. But uh, again, and it's not to say that one is more correct than the other. Um, you should just gauge whatever is being used in that situation and just try to mimic it as best you can. Both are used by the disability community, depending on the circumstance, again. Um, so with offensive language, I mean, this is just language that we'd like to stay away from in general. But it comes in the form of slurs, uh, euphemisms um, that are used to kind of replace disability. Um, usually created by folks without disabilities to describe folks with disabilities, and that has more to do with them than us, really. Um, metaphors, um, kind of using our community as the punchline to a to a joke or an argument, and also negative language uh, that we just would like to avoid in general. Uh, next slide. All right, so with people first language, again, uh, you lead with the person. So you would say person with a disability, people with disabilities, right? And for specific disabilities, person who is blind, person who is deaf, person with autism, person, 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 right? And if you're not sure what to use, you could just ask again, you just wanna gauge whatever is being used. But, uh, you know, quickest way to get my attention is just by saying Eli. But if you need to embellish, this is the way to do with person first. Next slide. So identity first, it's the same thing. We're just going to flip it on its head here. Um, disabled person, disabled people, blind person, deaf person, autistic person, et cetera, et cetera. And again, just ask. I think we will just appreciate the fact that you're trying your best, right? And, um, and so, um, yeah, just feel free to ask in that given scenario. Uh, next slide. All right, so some outdated terms and metaphors here. Um, and some of them you might have been using up to five minutes ago, and that's fine. We're not here to wag a finger in anybody's face. That's the last thing we want to do. We just want to inform, educate, hopefully discuss if there's time at the end, right? But here's some outdated terms. Uh, handicapped, You'll see that still being used pretty prevalently. We're trying to change that. Um, it's a bit of a condescending word to use. The implication is that we'll always need help, right? Um, and that, as you'll see, that's not always the case. Um, crippled, you know, I've, I, I, grew, I grew up in Sunday school, so I, I used to see that one in, in the King James Version, right? But again, it's something that we don't really use in modern times. Um, I won't even say the next one, but it starts with R. Yeah, just try to eliminate that from your vocabulary in general. Uh, wheelchair bound. I'm not bound by my wheelchair. My wheelchair is the reason I'm in front of you right now. You know. Um, so again, this concept of being bound by a wheelchair is something that we disagree with. Uh, visually impaired, hearing impaired. It's the word impaired that we take issue with, um, which we did use in the definition purely in a legal um, um, sense, but in interactions, this is a word you want to stray away from. Um, and metaphors, um, you know, blindsided, falling on deaf ears as sort of like a metaphor for ignorance or, you know, um, it's it's just using our community as as sort of the the punchline to to a joke or to an argument. As I was saying before, you might pick up a newspaper and say, "Oh, the economy was paralyzed by the COVID nineteen crisis." Again, I mean, I just feel like there are just more eloquent ways of of writing a uh, a newspaper headline, right? Um, the next slide. So. Um, Negative language as well, victim, sufferer. You'll find that folks with disabilities don't see themselves as being victims or suffering from anything, really. It's just another aspect of what makes us who we are. Um, and that's not all across the board. I'm just saying in general, it's it's not a great way to start off an interaction anyway, right? So and uh, to that point, physically challenged as well. 
pretty vague. If you ask me, I think we're all physically challenged, right? We're all bound by the laws of gravity. So again, it's not really addressing what's really uh, trying to be meant by this. And if you're gonna do that, might as well just call it for what it is. I think the community nowadays just appreciates a bit more directness. So person with a disability, right? Disabled person, if it's identity first, usually the best way to go there. Um, insults, I've heard all of these, stupid, dumb, idiot, moron, cripple, gimp, spaz. I'll probably hear them again, maybe today. But I just don't want to hear them from any of you. That's all. Uh, next slide. Uh, euphemisms, again, this sort of beat around the bush way of uh, addressing disability, um, usually created by folks without disabilities to describe uh, this community. Um, but again, it leaves a lot of room for doubts here. Uh, differently abled, not really sure what that means. Special needs. Uh, the, we tread lightly with this one because the DOE uses it, but you know, no mother wants to hear that their child isn't special. So we try to leave that one alone. But I think in general, it's something that we would like to avoid. Handy capable, apart from just sounding pretty, you know, uh, corny, let's say, is just, again, not really the way you want to start off an interaction. Um, slang, uh, there's that R word again, there's crazy, there's lame, uh, you could say that uh, you had a crazy weekend or a crazy commute, right? You could say that, um, you know, the the Cats movie was lame or that the Elvis movie was lame. But again, there are better ways to illustrate that same point. You could say you had a wild weekend or a ridiculous commute, or you could say that the Elvis movie was lackluster, right? There's no need to sort of throw us under that proverbial bus just to get your point across, right? Uh, next slide. All right, so some uh, disability etiquette basics uh, when it comes to interactions and accessibility uh, concerns as well. Uh, next slide. So with interactions, for one, you want to, um, you don't want to assume that everyone with a disability needs assistance, back to my previous point. Um, you want to ask before you help, um, and no means no, even if you think differently. It's more important that you ask how. And it's also important to realize that the struggle is important for a lot of folks. Um, speaking from my firsthand experience, the way I learned how to move around in society at large was through those growing pains and trials of error. So that's very important to a lot of folks. Similarly for the sensory disability community too, that ability to go about on themselves and do those things is only going to empower them, right? So again, no means no, even if you think it does and you need to respect them, right? So you always wanna to speak directly to the person with a disability, not to the companion or the interpreter or their dinner dates or whoever they met that night at the nightclub, right? Always to the person with a disability. Um, don't ask personal questions either. It's This could be a tough one because most of the time that requires a personal answer and you have to consider, are you gonna be in the right state of mind to receive that personal answer? Are you just being nosy? Are you just being rude on the two and three platform at 9.30 a.m., you know? These are all things you have to consider and also the level of trust that you have with the individual. So it's best to just avoid these personal questions, right? Uh, don't assume that someone does not have a disability just because you cannot see it. Big reveal, my disability is a mobility one and my wheelchair is out of frame. So surprise, I don't think you would have known unless I told you, right? So again, don't assume someone does not have a disability just because you cannot detect it. Uh, next slide. So accessibility considerations, uh, you wanna think about access in all your programs and services like we did today. We're doing our image descriptions. We have um, ASL here today. Thank you very much, ASL. 
Um, and you also want to be mindful when scheduling events and meetings, such as we did today, making sure that all these things are in place in the virtual sense, but even in the physical sense, is this place going to be easy to get to? How are the restrooms? Is there an accessible train station nearby? Is there a process with security at the front desk when you sign in? Do I need to do X, Y, Z, right? Um, do I need to talk to um, a staff member outside, be it a bouncer or a, or a, a major D or whatever it is? So um, having that information readily available is very helpful. Um, and in the virtual sense, it's not a product endorsement, but Zoom is the best platform when it comes to accessibility. Um, everything else is a far second, third, fourth place. So um, Zoom would be the way to go. Um, also include access to language in all your events and promotions. Um, so again, um, not just in the sense of letting people know what to do and when and how, but also in the way that it's written too, because there are folks with cognitive disabilities, uh, folks with some learning disabilities, dyslexia, what have you, that would need to um, digest this information in simple, clear language, right? So keep the SAT words out. Um, also, uh, be prepared to hire accessibility professionals, such as we did. Um, and we have resources to that effect on our website, too. Uh, next slide. All right, so we covered the basics. We're going to go into some more specific um, examples here with um, different disability types. So starting with mobility, such as my own. Next slide. And again, I mean, the international symbol of disability is someone in a wheelchair. We we definitely recognize that, but it could come in different forms too. Uh, wheelchair, rollator, crutches, cane, even some of the more ergonomically designed ones like you'll see at the top left, right? This is all, again, it's not always uh, the wheelchair. It's a broad spectrum of devices being used and, and manifestations of those disabilities. Uh, next slide. So for one, uh, we see a disgruntled gentleman here. It seems like he's not having a good time. There's a young lady who probably comes from a, a place of empathy. But back to my previous point, I don't think she asked how she could assist. She just inserted herself, right? Um, and to that point, a, wheelchair, a person's wheelchair is part of their personal space. I certainly consider it to be um, what this young lady is doing by pushing him. Um, it would be the same as as me just coming up to somebody and pushing them aside just to get through to a particular room or space, right? It's inappropriate, it's rude, potentially dangerous, potentially, potentially litigious, right? Lawyers are expensive. So if you haven't been asked to assist uh, with pushing or touching these mobility devices, um, don't do it. It's considered inappropriate and it could create a disabling condition as Arthur was saying before, moving these um, devices without permission. All of a sudden you're in a doctor's office and your cane is halfway across the room, um, creates a disabling condition, right? Next slide. All right, so when interacting, and you know, this is gonna to be tough in some of the more crowded spaces, but just do the best you can here. Uh, we see two scenarios, uh, two individuals, one is a wheelchair user, one is not, and they're sitting down. Um, in the second scenario, the non-wheelchair user is standing, but he's doing so at a slight distance. And why is that? It all has to do with the eye level. So for one, the literal meaning of the word condescending is to look down on somebody. So we want to avoid those kinds of interactions, but also um, lifting your head up to somebody who's standing two and three feet above you for 45 minutes while you talk to me about the weather can be pretty strenuous, right? I could do about 15 minutes, but after that, I might ask you to sit down or again, just stand at a slight distance as you see here. Uh, next slide. Accessibility of the, the space. Yeah, so this is very important. We see a, a young man here trying to reload his stapler and he can't. Why? The staples are all the way at the top. Now, granted, am I going to 
load up the copy machine with a thousand count of paper? Probably not. But these everyday things like staples, uh, telephones, computers, mice, keyboards, fork, knife, spoon, napkin, tablecloth. Right? These are all things you want to keep within reach. Um, and also being aware of desk heights and positions as well. Um, keeping aisles and walkways clear, especially to and from the facilities, the restrooms, the lavatories, right? And the entrances and exits, uh, very important. Uh, next slide. Keeping accessibility accessible. Um, I, I know some of you on this call might have, you know, service ramps and ramps to get into um, the businesses, but it's no use if it's blocked, right? So we have a, a, a wheelchair user here trying to access the ramp here at the edge of the sidewalk and who's blocking it? Well, wouldn't you know, it's a cop car that says policia. Last I checked, that's the Spanish word for police. Um, and, you know, this happens sometimes, but again, just try to keep these entrances clear, um, doorways um, open and unblocked if possible security allowing, right? Um, this will just create a better situation for everybody. Uh, next slide. Some accommodations, we won't get too into this, but you know, ergonomic equipment. So uh, there are some folks who might benefit from ergonomic um, uh, kitchenware, for example, in, in these situations, uh, maybe an ergonomic glass or um, cup, you know, what have you, uh, maybe going for the uh, Tom Collins glass as opposed for the wine glass, right? Just an example there. Uh, but yeah, these are all um, accommodations that you see in the workplace and academia at home for a lot of folks. And again, we'll be sending this slide that out so you'll be able to uh, explore that a little more yourselves. Uh, next slide. I'm gonna pass it back over to Arthur. All right, thank you, Eli. We're gonna talk about the blind and low vision community now. Again, we have a couple of stereotypical images of blind people, but just keep in mind that not all blind people use a cane or a dog. Um, not all blind people wear sunglasses, et cetera. Uh, it is a wide range. Um, and with that in mind, here are some blind and low vision basics. So blindness has a wide range. Most blind people actually um, are, uh, have some level of vision. People who identify as blind, uh, most have some amount of vision. Um, many wear glasses, you know, that sort of thing. And they're still considered, considering themselves to be blind. It doesn't mean absolutely no vision. It just means that you operate and do things in a way that, you know, somebody without vision would do. So you use a cane, you use a dog, you use large print, you use, you know, whatever. Um, our hearing and our sense of smell are not better. They're, we just pay more attention to them. We get, um, inform we, we, we get more information from them. And so, um, you know, they're not inherently better. We just pay more attention. <laughs> I'm your guy. If you're in the mall and you want to find Cinnabon, I can help you there. <laughs> All right. So, and, you know, one of the biggest barriers uh, for people who are blind uh, is access to information and low expectations. And I think access and low expectations are really the biggest barriers for all people with disabilities. So, all right, interacting with blind people. When speaking to a person uh, who's blind, you wanna identify yourself. This helps them to know that you're talking to them specifically. Uh, if you're walking with a blind person, you wanna stay on the opposite side of their cane or their dog. That just gives more room to maneuver and makes it things easier. You can offer to read written materials or assist in filling out forms. So for instance, if you have a menu and you don't have um, you know, a braille version or a large print version, or it's not online or whatever it is, you can offer to read that. If you are going to guide a person, be prepared to give either verbal directions or offer an arm, um, but it is their choice. You're gonna to wanna to find out which they prefer. Uh, don't assume it's one or the other. And it's best to have print materials available in some in an alternate format, uh, large print, braille, 
and accessible electronic formats, et cetera. Also, if you see a blind person in public, there's no need to make a scene or call attention to them. Nobody really wants to be called out, right? Um, if you think that somebody needs help, uh, that's fine. You can go up to them, offer them help. You know, can I help you? Is there anything I can do? Um, and, uh, but be prepared for them to say no. If they do say no, no means no. There's no need to continue to try to help them anyway, or just yell at them, you know, directions or instructions as they as they move along. Um, and, you know, if they do say yes, you want to give them options. So ask how you can best help. Don't make an assumption about what they need. All right. So uh, one of the two ways you can, you can guide a person is human guide. So physical guidance. You're going to want to find out which arm that they prefer to use. And this is which of your arms they're going to grab a hold of. So it's not you grabbing them. It's them grabbing you, unless they specifically ask um, for you to take out their shoulder or their arm or something. Uh, but generally speaking, you're going to, uh, they're going to hold on to you. Again, it goes back to that agency um, we talked about earlier. You want to give them the options. Your arm should be straight down and against your body. So not bent at the elbow and not out away from you like a chicken wing. Um, two reasons for this. When it's straight, it gives the person um, more to hang on to. It's easier to hold on to your arm than when you're, it's a bent elbow. And when it's down against your body, it gives them the immediate um, feeling of your body as it moves. You know, if you're turning or moving left to right, um, they're, they're going to feel that immediately as opposed to if you have your arm away from your body, that movement gets telescoped out and there's a little bit of a delay. Uh, if you come to a narrow space, you just want to announce that. Put your arm behind you so they can grab your wrist and walk behind you. Um, try to keep your arm as, as far away from you as you can comfortably to give them space to walk behind you. And then um, for, for uh, steps, you just want to announce that they're coming up. You know, we're coming to some stairs going up. We're coming to some stairs going down. You don't need to give them a count of how many there are or anything there are. They'll have a mobility device they're using or, or techniques that they're using to figure that out as they go up or down them. Um, but it is helpful to know they're coming and to know which direction they're going in. There's nothing worse than going up downstairs or down upstairs. Uh, very uncomfortable. <laughs> I know from experience. For chairs, make sure that you uh, orient them to the, the seat, right? So you want to show them the back of the chair as well as the seat of the chair so that they understand its orientation can sit appropriately. So the other option is to provide verbal guidance. A lot of blind people are, are very proud of their independence and that agency, right? And they're, they're going to want to not be physically guided, but get those verbal directions. I personally prefer it. I'd like to know my environment. I like to explore it. And I can't do that if I'm just being led around, right? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm bypassing all the things that I'm going to be encountering if I'm exploring it myself. So I'm going to want the directions. Um, so in that case, you can provide the verbal directions, and but you don't want to use vague language. You want to be precise. Um, imagine if you were using your GPS, right, and you put in your destination, and it said, "All right, navigating to wherever you're going," and it said, "Okay, first go over there." You're you're probably going to look at the thing crossly and toss it out the window because it's broken, right? No, it, that's not helpful at all. If you want you know turn by turn directions, you want specific instructions on how to get where you're going. So you want to use things like turn left, or, you know, go left, go right, straight ahead, it's behind you. If it is kind of a complex situation, it's not directly left or right or in front or behind, you can think of uh, the face of a clock, the person is standing in the middle of the face of a clock, and whatever direction they're facing is 12 o'clock. So based on that orientation, you might say, you know, oh, it's the, the bar is, you know, off to your 10 o'clock, right, or whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, make sure that the directions are just major waypoints. So think of like a GPS, it's not giving you every single obstacle to avoid. Uh, it's just giving you major waypoints, go to the end of this block, turn left, walk three blocks, it's on your right, you know, that sort of thing. Go to the end of this walkway, um, you know, until you get to the last table and then turn left. Right, so just major waypoints. You don't have to point out again every obstacle because their cane or the dog are going to help them 
um, navigate through the, the individual obstacles they might encounter. Uh, all right. So some blind allow vision accommodations. These are just common things that people with vision loss um, can benefit from. Large print, which we define as 18 point font in a sans serif family, 4.5 to one contrast ratio. Uh, Braille, which is a series of dots that represent letters or groups of letters. Electronic documents, so Word documents, PDFs, PowerPoints um, that are created in an accessible way. And then audio description for videos. This is a, an additional audio track on top of the regular dialogue and music that describes the important visuals um, within the video. If you are interested in checking out audio description, you have Netflix. Pretty much all Netflix originals have audio description in them. Um, so you can just turn that on and, and, and experience it. There are some reasons, uh, actually there aren't any reasons. Gonna pass it on to Tony to talk about deaf and hard of hearing. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Tony. I'm Tony Wooden. I am the ASL Direct Program Supervisor for MOPD, Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. And I focus on participants who are deaf and hard of hearing. I'm an African American male in my 30s. Uh, I am sitting in my office. And I'm just doing a visual description. I'm wearing like a blue cardigan. And I'm here in my office. A little bit about me, I am born deaf, I'm generationally deaf. I'm actually part of the largest African-American deaf family in America. And I am uh, very comfortable as a deaf person and that is my identity. Next slide, please. So a little bit about deaf and hard of hearing basics. Not every deaf person communicates in the same way. So it's important to remember that people have preferences of how they communicate. For example, ASL, gesturing, writing notes on paper. They might text on their phone to communicate that way. So please don't make assumptions that all deaf people communicate in the same way. Also, a capital D, as in deaf with a capital D denotes a member of the deaf community and having a deaf cultural identity, much like an ethnic identity because we have our own culture, jokes, performers, language and traditions. There are people who do not use a capital D for deaf, they use a lowercase d and that denotes not being involved in deaf culture, not using ASL as a primary language. They might just have a hearing impairment. They might not be doing any signing or spend time with other people who are deaf. And so I wanted to explain that about capital D deaf versus lowercase d deaf, I identify as a deaf person, therefore I use a capital D as deaf because I'm part of a cultural and language community. People in the deaf community, a little bit of information, we do tend to be very direct and blunt. That's often said about people who are deaf. And the reason for that is because we have a lack of access of information. And so, we often just will ask questions that might sound blunt or direct because we just want the information. For example, if a person who are deaf would say, how much do you make at work? I understand that for greater society, that's not a question that gets asked. But it's really because of a desire for knowledge and not an attempt to be rude or nosy. And again, because we don't have the same access to that kind of information that other people might have. So if a person appears to be blunt or direct, it's not meant to be rude, it's just inquisitive. Now for most of the deaf community, English is not their first language, which is something important to understand and remember. English and ASL are not the same. And ASL, sign language, like I'm doing right now, is not English in the air. It's not at all. 
Additionally, ASL is not universal. And I know most people are surprised to hear that, but ASL is American Sign Language and each country has their own French, Russian Sign Language. And because the same way there are spoken languages around the world, such as the same for sign languages around the world. So ASL is not universal. It's important to understand that ASL is not just the hand movements I'm doing, it's also facial expression. It's also speed. It's size of the signing for emphasis, body language. There are many components besides just the signs. Next slide, please. Interacting with the deaf community. Suppose you need to get a deaf person's attention. How can you do that without calling their name? If you're in the same room, you can get the light switch, turn it on and off to flick the lights. That's acceptable. You may also tap a person here on the shoulder like I am. And then that person can turn around and see you where they are, especially if you're coming from behind or the side and they don't see you, it's appropriate to tap them on the shoulder. Now, if you see two people who are deaf standing and chatting with each other, they have their own way of getting their own attention. For example, pounding on the table or pounding a person's foot, just you know, kind of pounding your foot into the ground or into the table will create a vibration. Sometimes a deaf person might also use their voice to verbalize, like just a quick little vocalization to get a person's attention without actually speaking to them. So those are ways of getting attention. So you're gonna to wanna to ask a person what their preferred method of communication is, sign language, gesturing, writing, or speaking in lip reading. If a person says, you may speak, I'm going to lip read you, please speak normally. Please don't speak slower. Please don't shout. Talking louder will not help me because I'm deaf. It actually will uh, make your speech come out a little different and it'll be harder to understand. Please make sure you're communicating in an area with enough light, not a place that's too dark. And that is applying for sign language or lip reading or writing on notes, because if it's too dark, we won't be able to see. Next slide, please. Now, communicating with people who are deaf, people do not all know sign language and we understand that, that's fine. You can also, like I say, type on your phone and a person can see that. But if you're going to use that method, keep it short and to the point because remember, English might not be a deaf person's first language. And also when you do have an ASL interpreter, and this is very important, I wanna emphasize, maintain eye contact with a deaf person, with the person you're talking to that's deaf. Please do not just look at the interpreter and ignore the deaf person. I've seen that happen where the person wrongfully looks and talks to the deaf, I mean, sorry, to the interpreter and ignores me and I'm the person you're really talking to. So please make eye contact and continue speaking directly to that deaf person so they feel included and it does not appear rude. So you maintain the eye contact and speak directly to the person that's deaf through an interpreter. And as well, you know, sometimes it can take a little bit of time to understand each other and obtain that way to communicate and having some patience is something that we really appreciate. Next slide, please. And we're going to just switch interpreters really quick. We're gonna switch, thank you, sorry. As these are some deaf and hard of hearing accommodations that some people prefer to use. The first one is an ASL interpreter, like I have here today. The next is an assistive listening system. that would be connected to an FM unit that someone would wear. And you could hear a person speaking through the sound coming through the FM unit with earbuds in your ears. The third is an induction loop. 
So that concept is used with your own hearing aid or cochlear implants and connected to someone using a microphone. And the same concept is that the sound comes through the microphone into your either hearing aid or cochlear implant. The next is CART captioning, which is communication access, real-time translation. So someone speaks and at the same time, it is being typed what they're saying. The next is close or open captions. So, you know, if you're watching TV or a movie, you would see the words coming on the bottom of the screen. You can enable that. So the difference between closed and open captions is that closed captions means you could either have them on or off. You could switch up the settings, the size. There is a transcript through them as opposed to open captioning, which means that the captions are going to be on screen the entire time. You do not have the ability to turn them on or off or change the settings for them. So as a deaf person, it's important to know their preferred accommodation. You can't assume that all of these will apply to any deaf person. Every deaf person has their own preference. For example, me personally, I prefer to use the ASL interpreter. With, I will also use CART if needed, open captions, closed captions, depending on the situation. But an assisted listening system and the induction loop would not work for me. I can hear, yes, some, but I would not understand the words and I would therefore miss the meaning. And it would just come in as sound in general, not words that I could differentiate. So you really just have to know to keep in mind who you're speaking with and their preferred accommodation. And next we're gonna turn it back to Eli, thank you. Great, thanks, Tony. Uh, we we only have a few minutes left, but essentially the rest of the presentation is basically reiterating these same points of again asking how before uh, if right or instead of if, um, and just you know living by the golden rule. I think is pretty much the most important thing here is treat others the way that you would want to be treated, right? And especially if they're patronizing, uh, if they're offering business to your establishment, right? So uh, even then, so because our money is green as well, right? So um, I don't think we're going to have time to go through the slides, but again, everyone will receive a copy of this presentation. And again, if there are questions, you could um, contact us. Maybe Arthur, we could throw up the uh, the contact slide there. Because um, unfortunately we have run out of time, but um, again, questions, feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, that's, that's our contact info there. There's a wonderful uh, website that I will put in the chat called askjan.org. And it's for accommodations. So if you're not quite sure what accommodations are right for what disability, askjan.org allows you to simplify it based on disability type or even in reverse by accommodation and then determining, okay, this accommodation works best with these population segments, right? So a, a wonderful resource for all of you to use. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank you all for being here on behalf of MOPD. Um, hopefully we'll get some questions via email. We're always willing to answer any and all questions and concerns. But with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Jose and Francesca. Thanks so much. Thanks, Eli, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, you know, we hope everyone's been able to take some uh, very helpful and uh, useful information uh, from your session and your presentation, and that everyone can start to take some steps to put some of these um, tips and resources and behaviors into practice, um, both, you know, in their businesses and venues as well as their everyday lives. Um, 
as always, uh, if you have any other questions about uh, your venue or your events, you can always contact us via email at nightlifeatmedia.nyc.gov or on our social media accounts at, at nycnightlifegov. Um, so we will leave the chat open for just another minute if folks want to pull down um, any of those web addresses. And uh, we wish everyone a, a wonderful day. Thanks again to Eli and Arthur and Tony for um, their excellent presentations. Thanks, it was a pleasure. Thank you all.